traveled. Honoring women who made a difference. A cool kids gift to our community. Welcome to a personal interview of Betty Kendrick, conducted by Lashara on April 17th, 2007. So, you have your own uh, gallery called Behind the Brewery? Yes, Behind the Brewery Gallery. And, oh, sorry. Well, um, this shows when we first opened it, my husband and I, and I have that article there that tells about it when we first opened it. And then here are a few pictures of me um, working in the gallery with my winter boots on. And this was some time ago, so you see the hairstyle and the, and the clothes are a little bit different. That's cool. Um, I was wondering, what kind of commitments uh, did you have to make to keep your gallery like in order, like? Um, well, uh, uh, we had uh, a number of artists that uh, we called upon, what you might call a stable of artists that exhibited at Behind the Brewery Gallery. But our first commitment, since both my husband and I were in education, art education, he was a professor of art at the university, and I had taught, as you will see on my to sheet here at different, I was an art supervisor and then I taught at uh, colleges and universities and I taught children and uh, even in nursing homes and so on. So our main commitment was to art and art education. So our gallery started out as a teaching gallery where we would invite people to come and see art. At the time we opened it in 1970, there were no other galleries in La Crosse. There had been a few before, but at that particular time there was no galleries. The pump house wasn't even in existence. They didn't come till eight years later. And there wasn't anywhere to buy art supplies, so my husband and I made a commitment that we would sell some art supplies, we would have a teaching gallery, and we would also teach classes. And then we called upon these friends who were artists to exhibit there. And we did have a very serious commitment. In order to exhibit at the gallery, you had to have a degree in art or art education, which then immediately put kind of a halt on various people who were very good artists, but they didn't have what we were requiring to keep our gallery within a certain realm of uh, commitment. And that was to people who put their time and effort to getting degrees in art or art education. Could be uh, a master's in art or an MFA, a master's of fine art, or in art education. And that's how we kept things on that sort of commitment year to year. And um, the gallery is still in existence, though since my husband died three years ago, uh, I am only open by appointment and whenever I feel like doing something down there. But it had been an ongoing thing since 1970 until now, what, 2007? So mm -hmm. it's there. And I have uh, many uh, visual articles here that you might want to include, and that would be behind the Brewery Galleries. Um, what kind of... Uh classes did you teach? Um, I taught a children's class, uh, both my husband and I did, at the gallery called Art Impacts. And I have some visual things here that would show our advertisement. I have to pull it up right there. That was Art Impacts. We did that for a number of years. And then the university hired me through the continuing education to teach Summer World. And I taught lot of summer world classes with children and then later see I had a picture here of some of the children in summer world at the university and that was I let me see is the date on there 1982 or 86 what does that say down there 86 86 well that shows the children they're all grown up now and that shows the children they were doing paper mache three-dimensional things. They were painting, and look at all their glorious paintings on the wall. Yeah. So that was the kind of art that I taught. Now, on the reverse of that, 
it shows some of the women from a nursing home. Now, sad to say, since that was in what is the date? 86. 86. Sad to say these women are all deceased. But at that particular time, I was teaching weaving on those small looms to the nursing home uh, women and men. And um, I also <coughs> taught at Behind the Brewery Gallery clay classes, batik classes. Um, for 12 or more years, I taught how to decorate Ukrainian eggs. That was always a delightful, fun thing, because I would have men, women, children, all ages. And uh, up until just uh, a summer or so ago, I was still, and I do have all my equipment there and might still do it, uh, I was showing people how to throw on the wheel, and I have some pictures of some little children here where I am demonstrating. These, these little tykes came from a nursery school, a little preschool. I, don't, I forget which preschool. I think it might have been congregational preschool. And they came to watch me throw pots on the potter's wheel. And then afterwards, they all got a big lump of clay and made squeezies and this and that with their clay. Had great fun. I think I read that you taught at some colleges. Yes. Um, yeah, I taught at uh, a Commonwealth College in Pennsylvania. It was part of Penn State University. It was in Abington, PA, and it was their two-year type college before they went off to the main campus. And I was teaching clay classes, ceramics, and I also taught art history, art appreciation. Uh, and that was a part-time job, actually, that first year I was teaching there. And that was right after I had my master's. Prior to that, I had been an art supervisor in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, uh, where I had three schools and had to go from school to school teaching the teachers, teaching art, and then working with the children, too. Then um, I also taught art at a, a school in South Philadelphia called, um, uh, it was a, a settlement music school. I only did that on Saturdays, but I had a lot of experience then with the children and teaching art, and that was a great joy. Later, I was hired by the Slippery Rock State College for, and I taught there, I think it was three years. I, I'd have to look up on my sheet here. Oh. Um, and I taught art there. And that was before I uh, came to Wisconsin and uh, had married Dale Kendrick in 1962. And he was teaching at the university here. And so I moved here to be with him. And uh, I did teach some classes at the university. I taught one summer. Um, I was teaching a ceramic class while we were waiting for a ceramic professor to come to La Crosse. He was busy getting a degree or something, and so I was filling in. And then it, I also taught design, drawing, and um, some art appreciation during that particular interim. And that was in the years of 64, 65, when I was teaching at the, uh, uh, it was the Wisconsin State College at that time, where it became a university. And also, uh, this was somewhat before I opened Behind the Brewery Gallery. It was in the mid-60s. Um, when you um, were thinking about being a teacher in art or teaching art, did who inspired you? Like, Well, ever since I was we little, like a lot of people who are find themselves able to do art, able to draw. I could draw. I could draw from when I was, you know, four and five years old, and I remember having a blackboard and drawing on it. Or people would give me sketchbooks or lots of plain paper, and I would draw and draw and draw. And it just seemed a natural thing that, and I, I had always been, you know, praised in school. Oh, she could 
wrong. And I did, when I was in high school, have art teachers who were very supportive and also helped set me up with uh, going to evening classes and Saturday art classes for young people in my hometown in, in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. And uh, I can remember one woman, Alice Wilsey, and she would help me go to a jewelry class because that was her interest, making jewelry. So in high school, I was doing things in the high school and then out of high school. And then it just seemed natural that I went on to college that I would major in art or art education, as it turned out. And always had great success in my, uh, in my art classes. I, I have kind of an artist statement here, and uh, uh, one of the things that I, I said that when I went on in, in graduate school at Penn State, I thrashed around with hammers, chisels, wood rasps, creating mythic figures and animals from my impressionistic attacks on art media. No art material was safe from my investigation on how far I could work the surfaces. So after making the forms, that I loved working to perfection. I learned to respect hard work and sore muscles in what is creating art. <laughs> I just had to read that at that point. Um, did you, were you ever like frustrated like when you were trying to create pieces of art? Oh my, of course. Aren't we all? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, I did stitchery of this type, three-dimensional, very large stitchery. I have some articles and uh, things here that showed where I exhibited the stitcheries. And that went on for about 12 or so years. And all of a sudden, I was like so tired of stitching and sewing and sewing and stitching and, and many, many people here in La Crosse have my stitcheries and I exhibited the art fair in the green. But all of a sudden in about 1975, 76, I was just like fed up to here with threads and I was completely frustrated by that whole thing of continually sewing, sewing and maybe getting you know, my arm was getting tired or something. So yes, you do get frustrated and you move on into something else as I did. It was around that time that I started to do batik, which was an entirely different art media and a different flow of the image that would come out. And then I was using brushes and not so much the needle. But now I find that I have come almost a full swing now in the 2000s, I am again using needles and threads and I'm knitting and doing a lot of knitting. So you do go through frustrations, but you don't stop. You just, you know, look around for a new way. Uh, maybe uh, it becomes an art therapy, the artist in need of art therapy, and you change and you do something else. And so I did batik. I went into further of my clay work. I drew a lot and that developed. My husband and I travel and I kept travel diaries. I have now, that one says number 35. I have 40 of these. I numbered them and so I brought along just a few. There's number 39 and the different places where we would go. We took art students to New York every year to do the art music and theater scene. And I'd been to Scotland. We've traveled to Egypt some 18, 20 times, I've been to Greece, Italy, and so on. And so I kept these travel sketchbooks. And that was, again, a, a switch and a change from what I had been doing. How, if, when you say you traveled, how long would you stay there? Well, they were two week tours. Um, I always jokingly say, and he was, Dale Kendrick, was the tour director of art and archaeology. And we worked with a, um, a company out of Chicago Seminars International, and Dale was their tour leader for art and archaeology to these various countries. And it was primarily Italy, Greece, Turkey, Egypt, within the Mediterranean area. And then jokingly, I would say I was the tour ender. 
as he was the tour leader, because I did have a part in helping him see that everything went on track. And they were two week tours. And also when we went to New York City from La Crosse, uh, in the early years they flew the students from the university, but it got very expensive. So then we started to take a bus and we would go a whole week to New York City, the week of Thanksgiving break. We would leave Monday morning and then we would return the next Monday morning. And the bus ride was 22 hours on a bus from the back door of the Fine Arts Building at the University campus to the theater district the next morning, 22 hours, in New York City. And people still in La Crosse talk about those trips. So we did have a lot of La Crosse contacts, students and the community um, going off to New York. And every once in a while I run into someone and say, oh, do you remember the time we would have on the bus or so on and so on. Other than um, your experiences with Behind the Brewery, um, what kind of jobs have you done, like, without art, have you? Uh -huh. <laughs> well, start in the bathroom, if you will. <laughs> that always needed to be tidied up and cleaned. Uh, the floors had to be swept, the dusting, and uh, I was, my husband and I would do these kind of jobs, either alone or together. Uh, we would do a lot of hammering and nailing and repairing of, and painting the exterior, the interior, uh, putting up the shows. Uh, that would be involved with the art shows. But yeah, there was a lot of maintenance that just he and I, it was really what you might call a mom and pop operation. It's just the two of us, though we would hire occasional help. And when we first started, uh, back in 70, 71, there was even one summer when we dug um, a trench to fill with cement to make a foundation, which now is the pottery shed. But we would do that all ourselves, and I can remember pushing the wheelbarrow with cement, doing it all. Um, Not that I did it all <laughs> myself, but with you know the two of us and then occasional. What would you say was your favorite um, show, like exhibit? Oh my, we held for almost 27 or more years, we held three shows a year. Um, one of the f really favorites had to do with the only lacrosse artist that I exhibited at Behind the Brewery Gallery, and that was Marion Bean. Now she had been written up in that first book about the, the women in La Crosse. And Marion, uh, she and I became early on friends, and every May I would have an exhibit of her work, and it was always a delight both to work with her and to see the new imagery that she painted of the La Crosse area and the Cooley region, and historic buildings and uh, the river, and so that was always a delight. But then there are other many, many other memorable shows. We always had a theme. One year we had, now this is not with Marion, but with our other artists, we had a theme show where it had to be a floating art show because we are by the river. We had art that had to float. Another time we had um, a jewelry show and uh, it would be uh, special items of jewelry special wearable art. Uh, we had a pottery show that we titled uh, food, Featuring Foods, and the pottery then had to be made so that, you know, a lasagna tray or a, a big tray for hors d'oeuvres or mugs or something to drink out of, so it was a pottery food type uh, exhibit. We have had uh, so many other theme shows here. Uh, I can't just put my hands on just one of them, but they were in, a, in particular themes. Um, who made a positive impact on your life? Oh golly, many, many people uh, in my uh, days at Penn State University where I was in the art education department, there was a couple of uh, 
professors that really made a huge impact on my life, and one was Victor Lowenfeld. And he was what today he would almost refer to as a guru in art education. He is deceased, but at that time, we were a small class. There were only about eight of us in the art education class at that time, and he more or less took us under his wing and became almost like um, a father figure, if you will. And both my husband and I were influenced by him. Um, when I was getting my master's and then Dale was working on his PhD, we both had classes with Victor Longfeld, and he became much more than just a professor. He was also a friend and guided us along and uh, took an interest in the jobs we were about to undertake when I was teaching at the Ogons campus or later when I went on uh, and to other areas of art, he would always applaud us. So he was one really significant factor in my life. And then there were, uh, I had, remember, a sculptor, uh, uh, a teacher, professor in sculpture. And I, as I had talked to you, how I was thrashing around with hammers and chisels and so on. He was always very encouraging and say, that's the way we do it. Hard work and a lot of sweat behind it and things did happen and I was able to do a lot of three-dimensional imagery with wood, metal, marble, and so on. One of the things that came out of my Egyptian uh, sketchbooks and notebooks and the various shows I had, I also put together some slide uh, talks that I gave around lacrosse to various women's groups, the AUW, the business women, the Christian women, and then also in schools. Um, I did one in the early days when the uh, Waldorf School started here. And also in uh, uh, the Arts and Technology School. I believe it, it was up in Northwoods at the time. And it was concerning Egyptian children's weavings. And I have that one I brought along. I collected the weavings, and so I have a lot of them. Plus, I put together the slideshow and then all the images from my sketchbooks of the children working with the looms and weaving and doing these. Uh, weavings, and so that that was something that uh, grew out of both my sketchbooks and the things that I collected when I was traveling in Egypt, and it became kind of a uh, factor in my part of the community uh, offering to people doing a slide talk. It was always exciting for me. How long did you teach art? <laughs> well, I graduated from high school and my four years then at the university, so graduated from the university in 54, started teaching. Well, even while I was in school, I was uh, teaching Saturday children's art. So how many years from the 50s till now, that's how many years, and I'm still teaching. Yeah. In fact, there's uh, one of the gals whose child might be here on the picture. She's going to be teaching a petite class over at the Hamilton School um, in their uh, Sota is it, or their technical school there at Hamilton. And I've been invited to go over on Friday and assist her. So yes, I'm still teaching, and that's a long yeah, time. About fifty years. Yes. <laughs> Yes, you said it. I wasn't going to say it, <laughs> but that's right. Uh, so I'm still involved, and uh, if invited, I seem to be there. Um, other than teaching, right now I do a lot of volunteering at the La Crosse Library bookshop. I love that little bookshop. Have you been in to buy any books? Well, someday stop in there. It's in the public library downtown on Main Street, and there's our neon sign bookshop, and uh, you might find me in there 
not all the time. We have a whole list of volunteers who work in it, but that's what I am doing now as kind of a volunteer job, which is different than my teaching. But I'm still involved in teaching, if I can. What um, other <coughs> uh, places have you been volunteering at? Well, um, there for a time I did, when my children were in school, and they're very much grown up now and have their own children, but I volunteered in their uh, libraries or their LMCs at Emerson School. And then later on, I read to children at the Hamilton School and also uh, volunteered in their uh, media center. And there was a short year when computers were just coming into the public schools. And I knew how to, I had a lot of experience with computers from early on. And so I was teaching the third graders how to do kid picks. And that was great fun. Have you ever worked with KidPix on the computer? Mm -hmm. It's a drawing program. And this was, I guess, back in the late 80s or early 90s. It was one of the teachers just had the, uh, the Macintosh, the Macs were first put into the classrooms. And I had had a lot of experience with one. And so uh, she was working on one day. And I said, oh, I could do that program. And so. I would take two or three children at a time and we would draw a picture and we would learn how to use the keyboard and type their name and type the information about the picture and that was great fun. So those were sort of volunteer jobs that I did that seemed to also be in teaching. Um, so it was volunteering in the schools and then volunteering at the public library. Um, I was going to say I had volunteered at the nursing home, but no, as I think back on it now, I was hired there through the, um, the technical college, through their continuing education when I taught at the nursing home. But there were times when I did some volunteering out there because they were either overwhelmed with the need for somebody to do this or that or another thing. And I found myself uh, leading an exercise group one time. Someone would play the piano and I would uh, sing in a very cracked sort of voice little songs that they would exercise to. But th and that was maybe a, a volunteering type job. I did. did a lot of knitting, uh, excuse me, knitting of mittens <coughs> as a volunteer uh, through the years. Uh, we used to have mitten trees in lacrosse. And I would either crochet or knit mittens to put on the, the mitten trees for little children or all age children to have warm hands. <laughs> that was a volunteer job. Um, when you make those things, um, how, how do you make those? Are they just knitting? Well, and stuff? Uh, this uh, actually is a stitchery. Uh, it's a stitchery sculpture. And I just took one of the small ones. I have a lot of large framed pieces. Uh, in fact, here, I don't, for some reason, my computer wouldn't print out proper. Yesterday, I had these on my camera, and it's probably my ink is going. And that is a stitchery with gold threads. Here is one that has a silk tie. Uh, here are stitcheries that are, are supposed to be blue and silver, and it's hard Aww. to see them. But I was so disappointed at the way my my uh, printer was printing out from my... There are others here that are my drawings. During the Vietnam era, I did a lot of protest stitchery, and this is a bag that was... Um, it has stars and stripes and stars and the stitchery threads. And it is a big pouch. And it was kind of a protest of, at that time, the killing and so on that was going on in Vietnam. And uh, I'm not sure I That's probably. neat. And this, see, you can see the stitchery threads on this kind of, this was water of the Mississippi idea. Oh. I did a lot of things with the Mississippi. So how long did it take you to make these? 
That's a difficult question to answer, and it's often asked of artists. And uh, in some ways, it's a question we can't answer because it takes as long as it takes. You start working on something, and maybe you're not working on this one alone. Maybe you're working on a whole lot of them. Uh, like I had a whole series of drawings. This is pencil drawings, and this is the Wisconsin Bluffs from the Passing Lane. And I would lay them out, and you draw on this one, you draw on that one. Uh, gosh, these are terrible copies of the originals, but you sort of get the idea. Here's a panorama. And the pencil line almost uh, reflects kind of the stitchery line. Here's they're gliding over the, the uh, bluff. And then I did a series of drawings of birds. These are Egyptian birds. Some more of the passing plane, the bluffs with the river and the road. And a few other, other sort of things. That Lots of artwork has gone on in my life. <laughs> lots of lots of it. Uh, but it's hard to answer that question. And I don't think I'll give you an answer because I don't know. <laughs> uh, how long, um, uh, what time, like, how long has it taken the longest, like? <clears throat> For a project, how yeah, long? Yeah, the longest. Have, how long? Uh, Maybe I can answer that by saying every time I would start something, it was done in a series. Uh, when I was doing these ties, and somewhere in here I have a, a, a listing of, of those particular, well, that was a listing of all the trips we had taken. <laughs> um, let me see if I can find that list. Uh, in the series, so that uh, I would say, I'm going to make 24 of these. And I would lay out, uh, here, it's a series of drawings, and with discarded 100% silk ties, that's one of them. But here, actually, I did, I did about, uh, 15 of them, and then I picked out 11 of the best, gave them these titles, and then they're all, they're all different, but within the same idea. It had to be a 100% silk tie, it was adhered to a board, and then I drew around them the imagery, oh, actually it goes this way, this is the bottom, this is the top. It, the imagery then were from my Egyptian sketchbooks one of the things, a symbolism or an icon in the Egyptian tombs are these little tables with table offerings on them. And then there's a lot of fish and a lot of birds. And so I would put those on it. And, um, and these were the particular series. So that whole series took me about a year and a half to two years. So that's when you so it isn't one thing of saying, okay, it's going to take me, uh, like, you know, you're in a, an art class this week and then you have it again next week and you have those two hour periods or something and you do a project or you're frustrated and you say, oh, I need more time. But see, as an artist in my life, I've spread it out. And then there's also other commitments you have to involve. Your, your family has to eat. You have to go grocery shopping, and you have to do all those other things that a mother has to do if she's raising kids, uh, or you like to go out, or you want to do this or that, or I'm working at the gallery, and that was a commitment where I did have regular hours, and the gallery was open at specific times. So how long it would take, you just keep working. <coughs> um, well, when you... <laughs> traveled to like Egypt and Scotland and stuff did was there ever a time where you like got sick of going to those places oh heavens no I wish I could keep going <laughs> no I never got sick of traveling I got ill sometimes once or twice from eating unusual foods or 
or just because you do get ill sometimes when you're traveling, but not very much. I, I, it wasn't anything that was life-threatening or, uh, you know, you just feel queasy sometimes. You've eaten something unusual or, or you've picked up a bug or something. But uh, no, I never got tired of traveling. I would like to continue travel, and I, I still do some traveling. In fact, I do have plans for some trips coming up. Are you going to need any of any of this stuff or something? Oh, yeah, we'll scan it at the end. Mm. Okay, <coughs> and we can put it into some other. Uh, I I noticed on there that you. Oh, let me tell you about this little thing. I I go to knitting retreats or knitting camps, and every once in a while, the person who runs them will give you a challenge. And the one year, the challenge was to knit a child's story or to knit something from literature that would appeal to children. Now, can you guess who this is? Um, the Little Red Riding Hood. No, she's no. not um, Little um, Red Riding Hood. Wizard of Oz. No, Dorothy? No. It, it's, um, it, it's Alice in Wonderland. Oh, I was trying to think, is that a dog And then she or a falls rat? through the pool of tears, oh. and the rat comes up out of it. And so here she is going through the pool of tears. This was up on a stand. I have lost the stand. I'm going to have to build another stand for it. But I knit her. And right now I'm knitting some other three dimensional uh, toys. And so that's how that came about. Um, have a whole bunch of knitting things that I did. Oh, that, that was one of the batiks. Uh, I, this particular vest, it's a child's vest for someone about five years old. That's the front and the back. And that also was a challenge. And this one you'll, was published in a book called Sweaters from Camp. And here is a hat that I made about the same time. And it's front and back of the hat, and then you can open it and it becomes a scarf, <laughs> and so that's from that. And then some little uh, other swoop. <laughs> that's going to make a big plunk and a whoop in there. Uh, little children's sweaters, I did a lot of those. And the last summer, I had to interpret a movie. And so the movie I interpreted was Playing by Heart. And here you'll see all the hearts that are knit into that vest. We had to write the script, uh, but the script was already written. It was a movie that I had rented. I'm looking to see if I have a picture that has the, uh, all the information. I should have put these in a better order. <laughs> Well, I don't know where that is at the moment, but we'll, it'll, we'll come across it. And then uh, the movie had been playing by heart, and so then I just did knitting by heart. And then the vest has all sorts of heart patterns, and I had to make it up, I thought. That's an early stitchery. life different today than you thought it would be as a younger adult or child? Well, you know, I guess I never gave it much thought. Uh, I've just been ongoing, ongoing as an artist and as an art teacher. And um, right today, uh, other than the fact uh, my life definitely has changed since my husband died, but uh, I have a very uh, strong support system with my my children, who are artists also, and I have some papers in here that show us, as a family, the Kendrick, Kendrick, and Kendrick artists. We had a show, and there's that, that talks about us as artists. Uh, I have this one from when they were wee little, and we used to send out Christmas cards like that. And uh, my son, Rock, he, uh, 
likes to work with uh, metal. He's, he's on the staff at the University of Wisconsin in Madison in the physics department, but he also, as an artist, does things with metal in a foundry. And then my daughter was an art teacher in the Madison School District for a number of years. And uh, she is now an at-home mom with two little children, but she continues to do art. There was another program here that shows us as an art family, I'll come across it later, where we would do shows together. And once we even took a show on the road, so to speak, we went down to Thibodeau, Louisiana to exhibit at a college, Nichols College in Louisiana just our family. And then uh, the person who had invited us, uh, he was a professor at the college, he had us meet with the students to talk to the, uh, the art students at that college on what it was to be an art family, where we all were involved in art. Uh, it makes for some interesting life now because there is so much stored in this closet and that closet and, <laughs> and so on. There's a, a lot of art that accumulates in your life. Um, have you won any awards for your artwork? Yes. Uh, on that VHS sheet there, it will list some of them. Uh, uh, I can't think of them at the moment, but yeah, there. <coughs> I was in the Wisconsin Craft Invitational shows, Wisconsin Designer, the 50th annual, and I got a purchase award at the Art Fair in the Green one time. Uh, I was in various invitationals. They, they maybe weren't, you know, uh, monetary awards, but they were recognition type awards. Uh, so, craft and stitchery type shows, an invitational uh, threads and otherwise. We had at a Crossman Gallery in Whitewater. Um, I, let's see, I received that from the YWCA, the um, 1990 was that, the Outstanding Award in Art. Um, I don't know if this is for my art, but on Friday night of this week, uh, the La Crosse Public Library is going to award me the Founders Day Award, which I am that must be exciting. very pleased to know that I will receive that. So yes, I've had recognition of various types through the years. And always been sometimes rather surprised by it, but also very pleased and thankful that my life was able to go in those sort of directions. Here, here was the, that was with that. Lots of appearing in the newspaper over the years. And I have all sorts of articles here. As I, when, I, when we were coming in, and I, I said I just kind of took these out of uh, the archives that I've been keeping since 1970. Uh, it's in six big fat notebooks, about this fat, four, three or four inches fat, and six of them in these are just a little bit of what's in that. I often thought, you know, uh, an archive, someone will somewhere along the line need to know what was happening at behind the Murray Gallery as a, as a interesting uh, thing in La Crosse's history. And I uh, thought, you know, they're the kind of archival things that might go into a library. Well, here today, you are going to have it on smaller digital form 
and all those big fat notebooks are just going to disintegrate. As you can see, all the paper here is yellowing the newspaper articles if they aren't put in special archival materials. Uh, just aren't going to last. So all that effort I put into those wonderful big fat notebooks, you, of your age today, will have it on digital format, CDs, and will take up so much less space. What disadvantages, disadvantages and limitations have you felt in your life? How you tell um, <laughs> disadvantages. Uh, I don't know that I ever felt having anything to, uh, what shall I say, to groan and moan about. <laughs> I always felt uh, going along as I was doing, um, certainly there were twists and turns in your road, but you, you, you go on and you do something, something that makes your life uh, better. Uh, maybe one of those instances happened in 1975. Um, I was really uh, in midlife, 40s, I was 42, and I decided it was time to do something entirely different. So what did I do? Five guys and I started the La Crosse and District Bagpipe Band. I was the only woman in a bagpipe band in La Crosse for about eight or so years. But here I am in the La Crosse and District Pipes and Drums. We also called ourselves the 7th Battalion West Mosby Volunteers. And here's a picture of our bass drummer with our, the title on the drum. And there I am piping. This was at a picnic. Here I am marching in a, a, a town in Scotland, Alkeith, mm -hmm. Scotland. I also marched in a very large 5,000 pipes and drums. We marched down Princess Street in Edinburgh. It was a cancer fundraiser, and that was a, a real hoot, a real high time of my life. I also did that same kind of parade in New York City on Fifth Avenue, but at that time I was only March about fourth of the parade because I had just had my hips replaced and I wasn't up to marching all the whole distance from 45th Street up to Central Park. So I did what I could and I did it. So, you know, I, I can't list or tell you any adverse effects or disadvantages. I just went on and did it. Here I am playing at a party. I sometimes would take my small pipes to schools and prepared a, a program and I played with uh, for preschool, kindergarten, I guess I played them for programs up to about fifth grade, both my tall pipes, these as I call the tall pipes. And see is there a picture here of me playing my small pipes? Here I am. These are parlor pipes, they're small and they're pitched so that you can sing to them so I worked up little things like Frere Jacques and Three Blind Mice and The Bear Went Over the Mountain and so on. And so when I play those little tunes at schools and kids can sing to them. This is a picture of my grown-up children and my daughter Danelle and she has two girls. That's Daniel and then my son Rock and his wife. This was taken before he had his they have a baby, a two-year-old, so that was the family. And she is also an artist, my daughter-in-law. He's a scientist, so, but he appreciates all the art we do. that um, you went to your gallery like when you felt like it in your appointments. What do you do with your spare time? <laughs> spare time. Well, uh, see, the gallery really was, uh, it was a job where I kept very, very uh, specific hours and was there, you know, open 
to the public. And now, of the past two years or so, uh, I, uh, I knit, I play my pipes, I take care of my house, I have a, a very interesting garden, and I love to garden. Uh, what do I do with my spare time? I don't know. I work at the public library as a volunteer in the bookshop. Uh, I uh, read, I belong to a couple of book clubs. I love to read. Uh, I don't know what spare time is. It's always sort of filled with something. If you were to see my calendar, uh, there's always something in each block that has to be done or things I enjoy doing. So uh, it's, it's a very rich life. Of, of just more or less continuing doing artwork, playing my pipes, reading, taking care of the house, getting together with my children and the grandchildren. Lots of fun things to do. What's your favorite art form to Drawing, <coughs> actually. I love to draw. Um, I have more pencils in my collection of art materials, and every time I see new sets, and you know, today, commercially, there's always something new coming on the market of new kind of pens or new kind of pencils, and I seem to have accumulated a lot of pens and pencils. There was a time when I was only using one sort of pen, because I used it in my travel sketchbooks, and um, now I find on the market there are so many other kinds of pens and pencils, so I'm accumulating them and I try them out and I draw with them. So drawing is really, I was never very successful as a painter. I, I, I don't know what it was about the quality of painting or something, or the color, or putting colors together. So I, I never really painted, but I drew and uh, did a lot of designing and then the stitchery was um, a thread drawing. So I was using embroidery, the classic embroidery stitches, but I was doing them as I would talk about them as kind of off the wall. They weren't like traditional embroidery stitches. Um, the same when I was uh, working with batik. I liked the quality of the craft, the wax, and uh, the hot wax. But it was more a drawing than it was actual other kind of work. And then um, uh, clay, working with clay. I'm not a potter, but I do enjoy manipulating and squeezing clay, making things out of it. But you might say the drawing is my top of the list of favorite things I like to do. What would you uh, say um, was your fav some of your favorite memories living here in La Crosse? The river. The river. I say that right off, <laughs> right off the top of my head immediately, the river. I think I fell in love with the river when I first came to La Crosse. Uh, and it's been an ongoing thing. I have a lot of drawings and sketches of the river. Um, we had, have still have a boathouse. I love to fish, and I have spent many an hour fishing off the dock of our boathouse, going other places to fish. We had a boat. We would take our children camping on the sandbars, and that was always a highlight. So part of La Crosse and living here was the enjoyment of the river. I still go out and to like just for instance this past spring it was just absolutely exciting to go down toward Brownsville I drove down to the areas in Brownsville where the tundra swans were coming migrating there were thousands of them and then I've seen the pelicans over near French Island and that's always my excitement to see the pelicans come through we are on a, a migratory the bird flyway, uh, and 
it's just just been exciting to have the river. And I always have to have my river fixed almost daily. I do go down to behind the Burry Gallery and step toward the back where I have a view of the river and get my river fixed. Or I'll drive down to Riverside Park and sometimes park there and have my lunch. And I'll have my lunch and knit, uh, sitting, viewing the river. Is our time about up? Do you have any more questions, Lisa? Um, oh, yeah. Well, where were you born? I was born in Hazleton, Pennsylvania uh, in 1933, January 4th. I guess it was a cold day. It must have been. But I am here. I lived in my hometown of Hazleton graduated from high school there, and then went on to Penn State University. And uh, then in 62, moved to La Crosse, Wisconsin, and have lived here many, many more years than I lived in Pennsylvania. And this is always have been, has felt this is my home, La Crosse. What made you want to move to La Crosse? Well, when I met Dale Kendrick in graduate school, we were both in art, art education. I was teaching at um, both the Penn State Commonwealth Campus and Slippery Rock State College, and he was teaching here. Uh. And I guess we were making the post office rich and the telephone company rich. So we decided that we would make our life together, and I came here. We were married in Pennsylvania, but then I moved here. And he would jokingly say, oh, and people who hear this and who know and remember Dale Kendrick will know what kind of a fun personality he had. He always used to say, oh, I just married her because she had a black and nectar drill and I didn't. <laughs> were, um, were your parents artists? Or did no. My father was a lawyer and my mother was a homemaker house. She took care of the house and children. And I had a number of brothers and sisters, but uh, no. Actually, in the family, I sort of turned out to be the only artist in that particular family, and I was always couldn't understand how that happened. But now, I have many, many nieces and nephews and cousins who have been in the art world and have gone on to do art things. So maybe somewhere back in our past, uh, my dad used to talk about his, his ancestors who were uh, woodworkers and masons. And so maybe that's how I came along and enjoyed doing things with my hands. Mm. Did your parents support your role in being an artist? Oh, yes. Yes, they were very supportive in seeing that I went on to college. And uh, yes, they were, because even in high school, when I went uh, to the evening classes or the Saturday classes that had to be paid for, they were always willing to help or sometimes in some way sacrifice so that I would be able to do that or I would have extra jobs or something could support that. But yes, my family always was very supportive. Mm -hmm. It's something that you hope other young people would be able to have, the support of family and professors and teachers and so on in their dreams. What um, types of things would you, like if people were other people, um, we're trying, thinking about going into the art profession, what would you want to tell them? Like, uh, <coughs> Really, just follow your dream, as you might have heard many, many people say. And uh, certainly, you would have to be in an atmosphere of a school that has an art program. Uh, and if you were to you know, visit a number of schools and see the one that you think you might fit into, 
uh, or if it's something that you have to do locally. Here in La Crosse, we do have uh, two, three institutions that uh, have very good quality art programs. The university here, uh, University of Wisconsin La Crosse, the Turbo has a very fine art program, and the uh, technical school, which I believe now has changed its name again to Western, or it used to be Western Wisconsin Technical School. But the, the three institutions, and then there are a number of very supportive galleries in the Pump House. Certainly, it's changed, really has changed the art scene from when Dale and I started behind the Brewery Gallery, and we were the only gallery. But through the years, that has changed, and always, we were always, would cheer every time a new gallery would open, or a new store would open, or something would change at the colleges and the university and Viterbo and so on. So investigate and go on and look and just keep going. What accomplishment are you most proud of? Oh, golly. What accomplishment? You know, I'm very proud of my children. That might That's be a, accomplishment. <laughs> an accomplishment. Uh, and the fact the way they have grown up, uh, and, and there were so many highlights of accomplishments, it's hard to say, but maybe I better give them a lot of credit. They were delightful when they were very young, little people, and as they grew, they are just absolutely delightful adults, starting their own families. to make some sort of order out of all this? And well, how would you go about it? You can just bring it up to the LMC and then have them scan it off. Uh, uh, do you want me to put it in some sort of a specific order? No, because they can uh, spit it out. Yeah. I'll go we have this. We're very organized. You're very organized. <laughs>